Olá a todos e todas que nos assistem. Meu nome é Pedro Lolli, sou professor da Universidade Federal de São Carlos e quero dar as boas-vindas a mais um diálogo da oitava REACT. Para quem está acompanhando o evento, essa edição nos organizar as mesas no formato de diálogo, já que não poderemos contar com a interação do público. Por isso, convidamos antropólogas e antropólogos brasileiros e estrangeiros, ativistas, artistas, em uma série de diálogos para pensar e dialogar como a antropologia da ciência e da tecnologia no Brasil pode ajudar a construir uma compreensão crítica do chamado capitalismo tecnocientífico. O nosso diálogo de hoje tem o imenso prazer de receber aqui o professor Jeffrey Lloyd, a professora Aparecida Vilaça e a professora Joana Cabral de Oliveira. Eu seria aqui o mediador desse diálogo. O professor Jeffrey Lloyd é professor emérito de filosofia e ciência antiga da Universidade de Cambridge, do, Rio, do Reino Unido, lecionou em diversas universidades pelo mundo todo, é membro de importantes instituições como a Royal Anthropological Society, da Academia também da Academia Britânica, da Academia Americana de Artes e Ciência. Além disso, tem 23 livros publicados, então é uma grande honra poder contar com sua participação nesse evento. A professora Aparecida Vilaça é professora do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Antropologia Social do Museu Nacional, da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Trabalha com o povo indígena Wari, que vive no sudoeste da Amazônia, e também tem diversos livros e artigos publicados, dentre os quais eu destaco o já clássico Comendo como Gente, e o livro Palitó e Eu, publicado mais recentemente. A professora Joana Cabral de Oliveira, professora da Universidade Estadual de Campinas, possui né, pós-doutorado no Instituto de Biociências, na Universidade de Oxford, ela trabalha junto com os Wayampi, o indígena que vive no Amapá, na região equatorial da Amazônia. Não poderíamos estar aqui em melhor companhia. Então, a ideia hoje aqui, então, é a professora Aparecida e o professor Jeffrey vão conversar sobre né, o livro e a professora Joana será, vamos dizer assim, quem conduzirá o, o diálogo, fazendo comentários e provocações. Eu também aqui na medida do possível, farei meus, meus comentários. É, eu acho que, por enquanto, é isso. Então, antes da gente começar esse diálogo, né, eu vou pedir para a professora Aparecida para fazer uma breve apresentação aí do livro, para contextualizar um pouco para quem está ouvindo, para depois a gente começar a nossa conversa aqui. Bom, olá a todos e todas. É, eu aqui, para para poder manter o diálogo com o Jeffrey, vou falar em inglês, então vocês me perdoem meus erros. E, e, uh, so, I'm going to switch to English to, to be in contact with Jeffrey. So, we are, we are here to discuss, I think, uh, uh, our, our recent book, uh, named, I don't know if you can see, but Science in the Forest, Science in the Past, that we both organized. And the book was based on, on a workshop that happened in Cambridge in um, 2017. Um, and in this workshop, there were um, people from several uh, specialities. So we had anthropologists from Amazonia, Melanesia, and we had also philosophers and history, historians and people that worked with history of science and artificial intelligence. So we are there to discuss, uh, um, to discuss the communicability between knowledges and sciences uh, across time so, and across cultures. So across time, we had people talking about China, uh, India, and uh, the Greek Roman, uh, the ancient Greek Roman and uh, Romans and uh, in uh, across cultures we had the the people from Mount Hagen and uh, the Tucanoan and um, more general uh, um, indigenous agriculturalists and the Wari people with whom I work so and and the the 
um, the panel on people that, you know, their mathematics. So our main subject in this book was mathematics. So, I mean, ra uh, hard science, although we have people talking about um, um, uh, hunting and agriculture, but our main subject was uh, the commensurability or the translation between all form, different forms of mathematics. Does it mean different cultures, different ontologies? Could them communicate between uh, themselves? Or is there any incommensurability between those sciences? So that's what we've been discussing there for two and a half days. And afterwards, we had this published in a how, uh, the how journal, a special issue. And then it came out as a book by Chicago University Press, How Books. So we are here to discuss um, some of the questions or issues uh, that we, we were uh, uh, in this book discussing too. So I pass my, my, my word to, to Joana or to Jeff Fraser. Bom, então, após essa introdução, vou passar palavra então para a Joana então. É, é, bom, eu acho que a, a primeira questão que me inquietou no livro foi justamente a escolha é, do termo ciência para designar diversas formas de conhecimento, né? Sendo que justamente os conhecimentos dos povos uh, indígenas é, é marcado como ciência na floresta e o conhecimento de povos antigos como ciência no passado, né? E aí, é, o termo ciência, né, para designar a ciência moderna, que nós, como ocidentais modernos, fazemos, é simplesmente, acaba se tornando simplesmente ciência, ou seja, você marca a ciência dos outros, e a nossa ciência fica como não marcada. A minha questão é um pouco, como que é, talvez isso reponha justamente uma diferença é, e uma impossibilidade, talvez, de criar algo que é muito claro como um dos objetivos do livro, que é uma valorização de outros modos de conhecimento. Né? Então, por que não falar em diferentes formas, diferentes regimes de conhecimento, e sim em, em estender a nossa ciência, que é, pode ser entendida como um conhecimento situado, marcado sociológico, historicamente, como um conhecimento construído por determinados sujeitos, como o modelo de conhecimento em si. Então, gostaria de... Tenho certeza que é, é, esse, essas questões estavam nos horizontes de vocês e gostaria de entender melhor é, a opção é, por a escolha de manter o termo ciência para determinar todo tipo de conhecimento. Uma das minhas motivações, pessoalmente, foi uh, não apenas a um público to some materials from ethnography and from ancient history that they were not very aware of, but also to get away from a sort of imperialism in the history of science. The history of science as a discipline, as a sub-discipline, was invented really with Western science in mind. But one, if, if um, we're talking about um, science elsewhere than in the modern world, then on the one hand we're, we're giving uh, due respect to other traditions but at the same time but well, this is the point that i think in the question is not made uh, 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 as important as it should be at the same time we're taking away from the notion that modern science is science in some unqualified sense Modern science is just as problematic, just as questionable, just as revisable, just as provisional as every other science. Now, that point wasn't, of course, included in the title of the book, but is nevertheless an important argument that the sciences that we, we have to deal with should be treated as on a par with one another. Now, the question of whether science or knowledge is the right term is a tricky one. And of course, plenty of people have preferred knowledge rather than science as the overarching rubric. But that has certain disadvantages because you can know an individual and that's not systematic. You can know how to ride a bicycle and that's not systematic. So knowledge is too weak a term and science has got, of course, the disadvantages that it has been appropriated 
by imperialist Western historians of science, but we can we can undo that. We can we can argue against that. And from that point of view, science is a better term, although of course it's not perfect. And in the process, science itself is revised. Science itself is considered in a very different light after we've done our e expeditions into different kinds of traditions. I was rereading uh, Jeffrey's chapter, and here he says that uh, I will read, Jeffrey, your words. So I think we can and should allow science in the forest and science in the past to be indeed science in the broad understanding of that term that focuses on aims and methods rather than on results. We find in both careful, more or less systematic observation, careful description, an interesting classification in explanation, in prediction, in the use of experiment, in the large sense of trial and error procedures. So in a way he's, uh, because these are his words, Jeffrey's words, it's, uh, it's his chapter, and he's uh, trying to show that uh, one of the main um, characteristics of, of science, as we understand it, like uh, trial and error and predictions and et cetera, is uh, those issues, they are is easily found on either the forest or in the past. So uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's a kind of comp complementary uh, view of what he said, so I mm -hmm. think if he agrees, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, we still, in a way, this is a central kind of issue from one point of view, because we're finding it difficult to achieve a neutral vocabulary in which to discuss what we're discussing. And the, the, the terms are, you know, I have some, some, some rather radical. Uh, um, and unorthodox views about philosophy of language. Our terms in the West, we, we insist on defining terms and we insist on having a univocal notion of, of, of what a term should, how a term should be defined. And we tend to, to, to privilege that. Whereas in practice, terms that we use constantly in academic discussion, as well as terms, of, in ordinary, ordinary terms. One of the examples that I was discussing in, in the book was the ordinary term water. Uh, the ordinary term water, right? The scientists will say, well, that's H2O, we know what it is, don't argue about it. But of course, water is, 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 is the term I have for that is semantic stretch. It's got enormous associations which can't be ruled out when we're talking about what water is and what it means to different to different peoples. Now, of course, is water translatable? Is it translatable into the Greek word hudor or into the, the Chinese word shui? And the answer is yes and no. But equally, the, the terms that are used by ethnographers, when they you, you, you use terms and you understand that the terms are being applied to a, an indigenous vocabulary, and is subject, therefore, to certain reservations about their applicability. But the term science itself has got all of these loaded associations, and it's an attempt to, to, to warn people about the disadvantages of those associations in order to move towards a, a, a new idea of what it is that humans have been doing when they've been trying to understand the world. So the, the, the book, uh, that chapter and other chapters in the book, and there are two other, two other collections. The, the one is, is in the process of being produced. And then we hope to have a third workshop. And they are quite radical in the suggestion that we move away from the, the terms that have, we've been used to in the West for so long, terms that have been Im imposed on other people's understandings in ways that I think should be criticized. Perfect. Yeah. Eu Good. gostaria de aproveitar justamente é, esse trecho né, que, a, que a Aparecida citou, é, que eu acho que leva a uma outra questão interessante, né? É, porque uma das principais preocupações do livro é justamente a troca é, de conhecimento entre 
culturas, né? especialmente é, se, se é possível, justamente uma, essa questão que aparece aqui de novo na conversa, alcançar uma inteligibilidade mútua é, a despeito né, das, das divergências comunicacionais. Nesse sentido, é, uma das coisas que aparece é que os mal, os mal entendidos, que estão sempre presentes na comunicação intercultural, é, não, não como ameaça, mas como oportunidade de buscar entendimentos comuns sobre o mundo, é, tanto para para né, pessoas que partem de uma compreensão monista do real, né, uma realidade única, quanto para aqueles que assumem uma, uma posição pluralista né, de, de muitas é, ontologias. E aí, justamente, a gente chega é, numa das passagens, nessa passagem que é, a Aparecida citou, de que é, o livro, de alguma forma, defende que uma ciência pluralista é justamente uma que se concentre os objetivos e métodos ao invés dos resultados, né? Então, essa é exatamente a citação da página 8, né? E aí, é, a gente gostaria de pedir que vocês pudessem desenvolver um pouco essa ideia, porque parece interessante é, pensar, sobretudo à luz da contribuição do artigo do Mauro Almeida, não só no, nesse livro, como né, em outro artigo dele, em que ele afirma justamente que, embora existam muitas ontologias, é, e aí no caso do capítulo do livro de ontologias na matemática, é, isso pode haver certa é, intertradutibilidade, -tra né, é, se a gente, citando justamente uma, uma, uma passagem do artigo do Mauro, ele diz o seguinte, pode haver intertradutibilidade se nos concentrarmos na pragmática da aplicação da matemática, ou seja, né, se, se de alguma forma o que o Mauro propõe é que justamente a resolução do problema, se os dois lados estão interessados em resolver um problema, o que importa é muito mais o resultado, talvez, do que propriamente as formas com que se vai chegar né, ao, ao, ao resultado, aquilo que ele vai chamar de um certo acordo pragmático. Né? Então, se de fato a gente poderia pensar que a ciência é, pluralista, ela poderia ser pensada como uma ciência pragmática também, né, que está, sim, pensando em resultados, em acordos que não vão discutir, por exemplo, os métodos e os meios de, de se chegar a esse resultado, mas em um comum acordo de se chegar a um resultado como pensando num problema muito pragmático, como, por exemplo, resolver é, um ecólogo e um e uma população indígena que queiram resolver um problema de degradação ambiental, né? ainda que eles pensem de formas diferentes e tenham arcabouços de regime diferentes, mas eles acordam ali num certo resultado. Então, eu gostaria de voltar justamente a essa citação e poder é, desfiar ela mais a respeito justamente dessa diferença entre né, métodos e objetivos de cada campo de, de científico e o esforço de, de às vezes, convergir para justamente chegar ao mesmo resultado. Posso fazer só um acréscimo aí a, a esse comentário da Joana, pergunta, é, que vai direcionado para o Jeffrey também, né, que é um especialista é, de estudos da antiguidade. É, assim, então, dentro do que a Joana falou do pragmatismo, ou pensando na ideia do Mauro de acordo pragmático, eu sei que no livro está já desenvolvido um pouco isso, mas eu gostaria de ouvir aqui para também quem está ouvindo ter oportunidade de, de saber mais e de ficar curioso do livro, é como que a gente pensa isso para uma antiguidade que nós não temos interlocutores vivos, né? porque esse acordo pragmático, com, na, a ciência na floresta, isso é possível nós negociarmos com os nossos interlocutores, né? mas quando isso é lançado então para essa outra ontologia né, grega, chinesa, como que a gente pode é, pensar é, essa, esse pragmatismo? Uh, the example of the biologist in the forest, it, it's, um, of course, there is a possibility that they will be have, have a joint concern with degradation, and that would be a very good example, but it's not the only example. I, I somehow think that that example is taking forest too literally, actually, Uh, the, it's not just a question of, of coming together to uh, share ideas about a common theme, 
because as I said in my answer to the first question, the themes themselves expand as there is communication, tentative communication, provisional communication, revisable communication, the themes themselves expand so that we start off with an idea that we might be investigating one thing and it turns out we're investigating many and we're learning from other people's investigation of those many things that there is no one subject matter to which, to which there is a definitive answer, a definitive solution to the problems. So intelligibility across cultures is a, a dangerous and difficult practice, but it's possible. Now, there are those, of course, that deny that it is possible. Uh, there's, th that's where the notion of incommensurability gets exaggerated, in my view. Incommensurability is a bogey term in the history of science. It's a term that frightens people off, and it, say, it seems to imply that we're all locked on islands uh, that, that isolate us completely from everyone else. But that's really something that doesn't correspond to one's lived experience. The lived experience of an ethnographer going and, 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 and traveling to another culture, or anyone going to, uh, I, I'm not an ethnographer, but I travel very widely. I'm stuck in the middle of China somewhere. And of course, I have to make the best of the communications possible in, in any particular context. But what happens is that you learn that the questions themselves have to be revised in order to make the most of the, the possibility of learning that the experience of meeting other people presents for one. So I, I'm, uh, again, it's a, it's a question of, 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 of a rather more radical program than perhaps it might appear. It's not just a question of saying, oh, well, there's intelligibility at the level of, of uh, particular shared concerns. It's that the concerns themselves get transformed as communication, provisional, tentative, fallible, as communication proceeds. And with mathematics, that's a very, this is a very good example. Indeed, Parasita pointed out that mathematics figures largely in the book. But mathematics, you see, again, the starting point for historians of mathematics is that mathematics is basically Western mathematics. And other people who don't do Western mathematics, who don't have the same kinds of numeral systems that we have in the West, are therefore in some way deficient. Nonsense. Nonsense. It's just not the case that they are deficient in their appreciation of quantity and shapes it's just that the way in which that figures in the, the, the particular societies in which they live takes a different, a different form. It's challenging to understand the effects of the cognitive faculties at work in mathematical context. It's, it's a challenge to understand that and, and, and to bring that to bear, to revise our own notion, notions of what mathematics is. It's the same as the question of science. It turns out that science has got to be revised. Mathematics has got to be revised. Of course, it's very uncomfortable. And sometimes I, in the kind of work, when I, when I meet my colleagues, I've got a seminar coming up later on this afternoon. And when I meet, meet, meet people who are brought up in the Western tradition, I often get accused, one, of, of uh, complicating life unduly, uh, two, of, of, of fudging all the issues by not allowing for the distinction between literal and metaphorical to have the role that it usually has, and so on and so forth. But I'm rather stubborn, and I really uh, think I believe that I may have learned something from studying the other people whose, whose, the evidence for whose work is accessible to me. So that was what I had in mind about pragmatics is, is, is fine. And indeed, in a more extended sense of the term pragmatics, pragmatics is certainly what we're talking about. We're talking about things that have have a definite result. In that context, it is results. But don't forget that I, we were concentrating on aims, and I was concentrating up Arasida in that passage she read, on aims and methods. That's to say, it's the endeavor of human beings everywhere 
to understand their environment and to understand their relations with other human beings and with other uh, sentient creatures and with the environment. That is the ambition that we can find that, that, that stimulates the reflections for, for which we have evidence. Reflections that shouldn't be somehow steamrolled and, and compressed and pigeonholed in the way in which in Western history of, of science has, has happened. Anthropologists have an advantage. You can actually go and talk to your people and you can find that they will correct you when you misunderstand, when you get things wrong. Now, I can't go and talk to Aristotle or Joanza, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, the, the, well, that doesn't mean to say that I can, I, I can never understand anything and indeed can, can revise what I have understood in the light of further evidence that, that comes to bear. The, the advantage of ancient history is that you have some very explicit, articulate, carefully worked out, uh, highly elaborate uh, uh, statements and accounts of belief and practice that uh, give you very rich evidence of what it was like to to be in the society in question. So, um, of course, there are some highly articulate, many highly art articulate uh, spokespeople for indigenous societies. I don't deny that at all. But the ancient history does provide one with enormous, uh, surprising, surprisingly different ways of dealing with problems. So, and although it's a shame that um, sometimes I feel I could talk to Joanza, but uh, of course I'm only kidding myself, but it's a shame that one, one can't get feedback from them. But at the same time, uh, the possibility of reconstructing uh, what they were doing and learning from it is there. And it isn't just a question of reconstructing it in the light of what we believe. Because I go on and on and on, what we believe is subject to revision. And instead of coming away from, under, from reading the Chinese or the Greeks, just confirming that we know better than them, I come away from the, reading the Chinese and the Greeks thinking, my goodness, what an extraordinary, uh, what an extraordinary experience that is to come in contact with um, people whose organization of um, their interests and their concerns is quite different from ours. I mean, it's shared certain aims and methods, but nevertheless quite different in practice. But I, it, the answer, the, the straight answer is that, of course, the ancient his, history is very difficult and we are at a disadvantage compared with uh, ethnographers. because we can't be corrected. Well, we can be corrected by some other ancient writer, but that's not the same thing. I think he said all, so I, I, I have nothing else to say because I think he's uh, totally right and I agree completely, so. Which you practice, Aparecida, the way in which in your books, in your studies, you move from one understanding of what the worry were on about to a new understanding. What you learnt from your father, Paleto, is something that is 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 plotted and traced through your own works, and that's that's a remarkable uh, testimony to the learning process. So, I, mean, what... and I think that as an anthropologist, my 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 practice itself is full of all those those main questions about misunderstandings and and uh, um and just you know being practical or some coincidence and some mistakes so sometimes uh, being an anthropologist in the field you feel like you were understanding the thing but suddenly you discover that you are not or you you're just behaving with bad manners and you feel ashamed because you never taught so I don't know, like eating, eating among the Wari. We always think that you know the indigenous people they don't have a, a good uh, 
I don't know, they don't have our uh, table manners or anything, but the first time I took a, a corn, you know, the corn itself and put it in my mouth, the whole thing to eat, like I eat at home or I see people eating, they were completely, uh, you know, just looking at me thinking, wow, she has no manners, no good manners. This is, <laughs> this is unbelievable because they eat, taking each grain out and put in their mouth. And it's completely salvage or, you know, horrible to put the whole thing. And I, I, I was acting like an animal. So sometimes you just, you know, the, the small things that you think that you're, there's no consequences, but they, they are, you know, heavy of consequences. They have plenty of consequence because after that, they just look at you in some other way or they are, you know, they, they treat you differently. So the whole work you'll be doing about understanding could just be, you know, kind of destroyed about when you take some corn to eat. That's, that's the point. It's about doing things, not just reflecting or, you know, in some things we do like instinctively, we just do it. We think it's the only way. And then you suddenly discover that it's not. Hmm. Sure. Sure. Pegando um pouco o gancho né, desse comentário final da Aparecida, uma das coisas também que é, me instigou muito na leitura é, foi pensar, tentar pensar é, a, a, como que a gente pode pensar né, na emergência do real. Vocês não usam é, essa expressão, mas uma expressão muito debatida né, na antropologia, sobretudo nos, nos estudos de ciência e tecnologia, tecnologia, é justamente a ideia de multiplicidade do real, né, ou multiplicidade ontológica, pensando muito, né, aqui no trabalho da Anne-Marie Moll, mas é, outras, né, outras antropólogas também, é, e aí, justamente, a, 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 ênfase, a ênfase que se dá é na prática, né, nas performances, de como que o real pode ser tratado como emergente e múltiplo por meio das performances, e todo livro dá muita ênfase à questão da linguagem, né? E a linguagem num sentido bastante amplo, pensando a matemática né? como uma linguagem. Mas o artigo da... O capítulo e o artigo da, da Aparecida se voltam muito para a questão da linguagem também, enquanto as, as questões de tradução é, da Bíblia e, e, e os processos de tradução que ocorrem no processo escolar. Né? É, e aí eu queria um pouco que ouvi-los sobre como que a gente pode pensar a relação entre ontologia e linguagem, qual é o, o papel é, da linguagem para tentar pensar uma multiplicidade ontológica, é, se a gente poderia pensar que a linguagem ela é produtora de realidades, então eu gostaria de ouvi-los mais sobre essa relação entre ontologia e linguagem. Well, I mean, this is again what, what we come to to um, the table with when it comes to ontology and language is a set of assumptions that are questionable. You know, ontology is usually represented as what's out there and is independent of that language or any expression of the ontology in question. Whereas language is something that's com completely different and uh, can be right or wrong or whatever it might be. So that there's a, a very sharp dichotomy between ontology and language that is usually assumed. But that's not the way that I see it, not the way that the people represented in that book, the Parasita, uh, see it. Because ontology is um, subject to emergence as you, uh, it's a quite a good way of putting it it's subject to revision uh, it's subject to to being created as an understanding is developed now it's always going to be dependent uh, if we're talking about what people say or believe it's going to be dependent upon language but the relationship between the two is far more subtle than the way I represented it just now. In other words, ontology and language are completely independent from one another. Because the ontology being expressed and expressible in language is subject to all of the, the, the problems of the complications and, the, uh, and what I call the semantic stretch of the terms that we use for the ontology. So the two are being 
uh, are in interaction with one another wherever one turns. I mean, that's what that, that, that is the, the ideal, that is the methodology that we should adopt. The, the ontology is, is subject to revision as the, the, the language struggles to express what you want to express about the reality that is being experienced by the agents that you're dealing with. So uh, it's, a, it's an inter interdependence of the two rather than a complete independence of the one from the other that is important. Um, so of course that's uncomfortable because how can it be the case that they are uh, interdependent? Well, it does mean that an awful lot that has, that has been said about reality and about ontology is, is potentially rather misleading, as if there were a, a single reality. Of course, to say multiplicity of reality is a step in the right direction. But what do you mean by that? And then if you have a multi multiple realities, how is there communication between them? That's the problem that we, 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 we broached before. The, 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 plur the pluralism and the multiplicity has got to be given justice to, and it's got to be taken into account by allowing for a permeability of different uh, resonances of the vocabulary that you use. And the vocabulary then turns out to be not, as it were, uh, a neutral, definitive vocabulary, but a vocabulary that's constantly on the move. Oof. Is that does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think that in the book, in our book, there is uh, about language and, and ontology. There is a there are a few uh, um, interesting chapters. One by by Serafina Cuomo. Uh, among about the, the ancient Greek Romans, when she says that there are two different ontological mathematics or two two different kinds of mathematics that that points to different ontologies, but you have the same language, exactly the same language. So you have one more uh, theoretical and one more practical, and you know different thoughts about the word, what reality is, what means, what practical means are, etc. But you have the same language uh, uh, being talked among among those people who practice different ontological mathematics, and I I, I think that uh, Karin Shemla on China has has the same point, and 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 uh, uh, the India uh, hmm. with with oh, what just a second oh my gosh Agat Keller Agat Keller. She says the opposite. She has the Sanskrit and Tamil people, different languages, but the mathematic uh, ontology yeah. or uh, knowledge that that goes back and forth among them. So sure. you have you yeah. have what what Jeffrey says. You know, you you just have both are in the making. Both are in the making. And on my on my um, chapter on the Wadi and mathematics, what I what I say about language is that sometimes um, uh, some some native uh, word or something could make them jump in a way to their to their uh, ancient or their other ontology. So some words they 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 take them back to some some kinds of uh, thoughts or different thoughts and 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 of course the, the the way back so some some thoughts could not be expressed for example in portuguese so they cannot have the word for number four for example because it it does not match their 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 view of quantities of the relational idea of quantities and not precision against precision so that's that's mix it. So it, I, I, it's exactly what Jeffrey said. It's just go. It goes from one to the other because both are not fixed. Both are in the making. Is that correct, Jeffrey? Yes, I think it is. I think that's well, well said and well put. Um, and it's uh, it, of course that is an experience repeated over and over. Uh, not only in the book, but in, in real life, where where um, 
the uh, uh, struggle to arrive at a new understanding. You know, th this has been discussed rather, rather unfortunately, again, with the, using the notion of incommensurability. I mean, we have a term like force, or we have a term like weight, uh, and those terms have, have been used as translations of different vocabularies at different stages. And even if you use the same term, are you meaning precisely what somebody else is meaning when they use that term? And the answer is almost certainly not. Of course, if you overdo that, the, the criticism that I face often and often, if you overdo that, it turns that turns out that you know the, the claim is that you can't understand anything. But that's nonsense. What you have to do is to to uh, suspend the assumptions that you're making as you come to the table and revise in the light of what you can understand in, in trying to make sense. This gets back to the question of not a threat but an opportunity. You, you find something that looks extremely puzzling. Now that's marvelous. That's a great experience because being puzzled, this is, this is rather a, a Greek idea. Curiosity is the beginning of, wonder is the beginning of philosophizing, something like that. Of course, one doesn't want to be too pretentious about the philosophizing, but it, it is an opportunity to, to discover something new and important in many cases. Sometimes. I no, go on, go on. No, sometimes it's merely intellectual, but often, I mean, to get back to the question of concerns about uh, about degradation of, of, of ecology or degradation of the environment, of course, it's vitally important. So these questions, although we are, you know, I'm an academic and I'm, I'm, I haven't been involved in activism, I'm, I'm not involved in climate change, you know, I, I leave that to Greta Thunberg. <laughs> But nevertheless, even academics should accept responsibility for addressing questions that are of, are of concern to everybody, practical questions. And understanding one another is one of the things that has been made, made such a mess of by people in this century. Right. Uh, I, I was, you know, a while you were speaking, I thought about different kinds of translation, and I thought about a work by Eduardo Viveiro de Castro on equivocation, when he says that you can do two different kinds of translation. So among Amerindians, um, you, you do not translate, uh, you know, the, the right translation for the word uh, brother is not, uh, you know, some, some word in the, in, in the native language or, or irmão or i don't know or frère or or something but the 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 right translation from brother is brother-in-law yes so, because that's that a brilliant you know, they, example. yeah that they are they are, that's what they are talking so when they talk when we talk about brotherhood they are talking about brother-in-lawhood or something so that's that's the meaning of a generality or a kind of general kinship or general relationality. So those two kinds of, 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 of translation, so this kind of deep translation or, I don't know, different kind of translation, they point to different ontologies. They, they make the different ontologies clear, but they, they allow uh, for a, a kind of understanding. So if you understand yeah. this difference, you can talk to people. Sure. But if you just translate brother by irmão or frère or whatever, you, you do not, you, you know, the, misunderst the, the misunderstanding is even deeper because you cannot communicate. Mm. So different translations, they can be very important to the way you can or cannot communicate, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it isn't, you have to settle on it. My wife is a professional translator, as some of you may know. She translates from French into English. She's translated something like 60 or 70 books. Uh, and she's faced constantly with this question. Now, you have to eventually settle for a translation 
that is appropriate to the particular book, to the particular context. But really, the implication of a Parasida's remark is that translation really always should be plural. You should, you should allow for annotation and commentary to explain the richness of, of uh, the statement that you're trying to translate and to allow for different ways of developing it, taking it in different directions. I mean, the, the translation, translating poetry is, a, is such a challenge. And I don't know whether you ever attempted to translate poetry from one language into another, but it's absolutely impossible. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't understand. And in fact, the, the more you, you, you offer different translations of wonderful opaque poetry, the more you understand, in general, what the poet was on about. I would like to also add a comment when Joana asked about the relation between ontology and language. It came to my head that if language here couldn't be able to do an equivalent with epistemology, because, especially in the history principalmente na história da, da ciência, né? por muito tempo a questão é, epistemológica, vamos dizer assim, pre, predominou posso tomar uma água. em relação à a, a relação ontológica. Então, eu queria saber de vocês qual é o ganho na mudança dessa ênfase da ontologia, da epistemologia para a ontologia. Eu não sei se ficou claro aí a questão. Uh, to focus on ontology to the exclusion of epistemology would be a mistake and vice versa. So what we've got to do is to, actually both of them, I made some remarks about the problems, some of the problems associated with ontology. Some of the problems with, associated with epistemology, of course, have been much explored and discussed because the epistemology seems to presuppose that there is a knowledge that is attainable and the question is saying, how? Well, that's all very well. But of course, the knowledge that you're aiming for is not as clear cut as is generally assumed by many people who are engaged in saying whether perception or reason or a combination of both is the right method of getting that knowledge. But equally, ontology is, is something that is more or less explicit. I mean, we use the term ontology often in contexts where it's some interpreter that is actually providing the ontology. It's not, it's not that the ontolo ontological discourse is something that is, is there in the text directly. It's something that is uh, extracted from the text. So there are problems about both of those terms. They are both rather, well, they're like science itself, as I've said before, that they are terms that are due to be <clears throat> criticized. We have to use something like those terms in order to generalize over different uh, ideas about approaches to knowledge or about what knowledge is of. We have to, we have to make sure that we, we, we can communicate about that. But it's just as well to put them both in scare quotes, as we say, and, and not assume that they're, they're, these are hard-edged disciplines that can be uh, settled by some kind of, of uh, might be arbitrary decision taken on the basis of a priori reflection. They are they are dangerous terms, both of them. I mean, dangerous in the sense that we can be we can mislead ourselves into thinking that they're more determinate than is actually warranted. I don't know, I, it, it, I become more skeptical as time goes on. In fact, you know, I used to know what the answers were to these questions. <laughs> but nowadays, I find that I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I have certain opinions about the way in which the debate has proceeded. But I don't want, we don't, we don't want to, we didn't. Uh, because the, my chapter was entitled The Clash of Ontologies. I think originally I had a question mark at the end of that, you know, Parasita? I think the question mark got left out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'll put a question mark back in. 
please. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yes. <laughs> may, may I ask a last question? Is it, pos is it possible, jo Jeffrey? Certainly. Ok. Uh, uma, uma das, acho que uma das coisas que apareceu aqui na, na resposta é, do Jeffrey e que aparece muito fortemente no livro é a ideia, nessa ideia de uma oportunidade, né? Que, na verdade, os mal entendidos e essa, essa, incomens, né, essa incomensurabilidade completa, né? Que essa falta de comensurabilidade completa é, da tradução é, é uma oportunidade, né? E eu acho que isso talvez seja muito claro para o nosso fazer antropológico, né? como a Aparecida lembrou no, no texto do Eduardo Verde Castro sobre a equivocação controlada, né? como isso é uma questão metodológica relevante para a gente pensar na antropologia, mas pelo que a gente né, lê no livro, pelo que a gente ouve falar aqui né, da, da, da conversa com o Jeffrey, isso também aparece né, na, na, no processo né, do, das pesquisas em história, né? então essa diferença, a diferença ela é importante e ela é uma oportunidade para pensar. E aí, é, a minha questão ela é muito mais, talvez, direcionada à parecida, porque é, eu gostaria de, de talvez, é, ouvi-la, a parecida, sobre é, como que a gente pode pensar nessa diferença comunicacional dentro de uma relação intergeracional numa população como né, o Zoari. Porque o exemplo fascinante que você traz sobre como a palavra amor foi traduzida é, pelos missionários, né, por uma palavra em Zoari que seria algo como é, não desgostar, que justamente evidencia como o campo da inimizade ela é relevante na ontologia e no pensamento Wari. É, uma coisa que eu percebo no meu trabalho com os OMP é justamente como esses processos de tradução, sobretudo no campo né, da, da ação missionária e no campo escolar, justamente vai produzindo uma, 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 uma transformação semântica, né, que é justamente o que vocês falavam antes sobre como isso é relevante, né? essas idas e vindas, e esse processo de transformação da linguagem, é, e aí eu, eu fico sempre um pouco, digamos, aflita ao ver como os jovens manipulam a, a língua de uma forma muito diferente da, das gerações mais velhas, dos seus avós, né? Então eu gostaria de te ouvir um pouco, sobretudo, como que você entende, é, isso também seria, como, se, se é possível tratar isso como uma oportunidade, né? Porque tudo bem, isso é intrínseco, talvez, ao processo de linguagem, a transformação, mas como que é, é isso internamente a uma população que muitas vezes é uma população que tem uma... Né, a, gente, a gente vê a, a, as ameaças todas que essas populações sofrem na na, na, para a perpetuação da sua língua, para a perpetuação de alguma, né, do, dos, seus, dos seus modos culturais, e eu acho que uma das coisas que talvez a gente sempre nós que trabalhamos com, digamos, com uma certa, um certo campo teórico, uma coisa que a gente sempre acaba ouvindo é justamente como talvez as nossas análises tirem as relações de poder é, do campo analítico, né? Então, talvez, essa minha questão também passa por aí, né? Então, a gente tem ações missionárias, a escola, né? E aí, isso tem uma, uma, uma questão de poder é, que faz com que talvez essas transformações ocorram de outra forma, que não da forma como a gente vê nos campos de tradução que a gente está aqui conversando. Né? Então, gostaria de te ouvir um pouco sobre isso. I, I, I just I, I can I can talk about the Wari mainly because that's not a subject that I've been thinking, but I think that Joana is right. There is there is a difference in generations. So They are the monolingual, there are the monolingual people, you know, people from, I don't know, 50 years old or up, and those bilingual. And uh, because the Wari, they still speak among themselves, they speak Wari language. But they are, they are more and more into the, the Brazilian language, mainly uh, through internet. So they are all on Facebook, the young people. And they, on Facebook, they, they write in Portuguese. And they use a lot of the terms uh, love, love, love in Portuguese, amar. So, you know, a wife, uh, uh, I don't know, telling her, her husband that she loves him. And I think it is not, not just like, it's just love, love, plain love, because they, they are using Portuguese. And 
So I think that in this context, because I think that Jeffrey is totally right, we have to, to contextualize everything. So I'm sure that when they are talking with their parents, uh, when they say um, love in Wari language, they were, they were referring to not dislike, not to dislike, of course. But I think that when they, they migrate to Facebook, even if they write not to dislike or in in Wari, they are they will not mean you know they will not have enmity uh, in the background of the thoughts. They are just mainly being wise. They are mainly relating. So I think that's the same. So because it's we cannot uh, take indigenous um, I don't know behavior or knowledge if we do not contextualize it. Because of course, for example, a shaman. He he. Once I saw a shaman be interviewed, I was I talked to a shaman, and he was talking to me about spirits or animal spirits and how they come and how they talk, etc. So after I don't know one day after the missionaries interviewed him for a broadcast or TV something, and the missionaries were asking him, "Does spirit exist?" He says, "No, of course not. Of course not." And uh, it's not that he was lying or trying to be to be nice to the to the missionaries, but he was relating. He knows that for you know in this world that the missionaries live, spirits like they have animal spirits do not exist. So he was not trying to pose his point of view, but he was trying to relate and to answer the questions. So I think that this is you know so important to contextualize and not to think about you know they, they change or they lie they it's not that because everything is contextualized so everything depends on because indigenous people as we do uh of course all they say all they think depends on to whom they are talking to what they want to what effects they want to produce so that's what we do too. So it, it's very malleable. It's very, it's very plastic. That's what I think. I don't know, Jeffrey, if he has a point. There's uh, nothing very much that I can bring to that um, discussion from antiquity. But in terms of my private experience, uh, my father was, had to learn English as a foreign language because his first language was Welsh. And in uh, at home, we he slipped into Welsh from time to time for particular for particular concepts in particular, but not just concepts, but also for ordinary communication purposes. So I picked up a certain amount of Welsh, but there were certain terms that were completely untranslatable into English. So he didn't bother to translate them because there's there's no way in which you can talk about hull in English. Hull is a, is a kind of feeling. That Welsh people have about Wales. Now that's pretty difficult to express in in other languages. So I mean, in terms of my personal experience, I mean, I was lucky enough to have a number of European languages fairly fairly early on, and I'm not frightened in speaking foreign languages. Although I'm, you know, I'm never as grammatical as I should be, and I, as I say, my Portuguese, I, I I pick up certain expressions that you use. But of course, I don't. I don't follow exactly what you're saying. So, but on the other hand, I'm not. I don't consider myself a, a typical Englishman who thinks that English is the only language that was ever invented for, for communication purposes. Or indeed, the same thing with the French, because the French assume that French is the natural language. So I, I've, I've been used to to uh, taking on board the very point that Abarathid has, has been been making. That you you move from one register into another, and what is so uh, alarming about that? Nothing's not alarming about about that at all. Indeed, it's it's a great it's a great advantage to be able to do so, even though of course uh, you can you can fall into mistakes. You can make you can make mistakes. You can do things that seem to your your host. To be quite inappropriate, like like a parasita eating her maize uh, and devouring it, putting it in her mouth as a whole, rather than taking out each particular. That's a lovely story, a parasita. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I think that there is the, the, the category of risk, and I'm thinking about our beloved Marshall Salins, who, who was always uh, talking about uh, the structure of the conjuncture and how you, when you, 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 you were in contact, you relate, you put your own categories at risk. And sometimes it, it, it might imply your own death, like Captain Cook and, uh, you know, the, the famous, infamous story of Captain Cook. And, 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 and that's what I think it's interesting. So misunderstanding could be very dangerous. Uh, it's a risk. And you cannot relate if you do not, uh, 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 you know, jump into this possibility because it's always there. It's always there. True. So, you know, it's it's when I, I've been working and the Wari, they can play with this very easily because when I was there for the first time and I for the first time I went with them to their uh, to their gardens far away, isolated, because in the village there were always one or another white people just circulating or a teacher or something. But the first time I insisted that they took me to their 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 gardens. I would like to be there with them, etc. So the first time when I arrived there, they took my arm, they touched my arm, and said, "Oh, you have fat there. We can eat you." You know, of course, I don't know. I was there. I said, "My answer was that if you eat me, my all my relatives will come here to fight," <laughs> because I I was in doubt, but. You know, of course, it did not happen because the Wari have, have, you know, they have a very um, terrible experience with white people arriving and massacrating everything. But Bispo Sardinha, you know, in the 16th century, did not have the same experience because they, he was eaten. So, you know, depends on the context. But of course, they can play with categories. They play, and they were trying to scare me, but to play with me, but you know, to 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 make clear that they understand mm. what I do understand, and and play with this. I just I just say thank you very much for both of you, and say I'm I'm glad that you thought about my concerns. What's wonderful for me to listen to you. To meet you. I hope we will meet again. Yes, I hope so. In a better condition. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, it was for me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you, Jeffrey, too, to come and join us. And uh, and it was the huge. You know, you made my day just talking to you and seeing your face. I was missing you so much. So. That's okay. that's my my gift. Igualmente. Okay. 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 <laughs> so see you. Yes. Well, actually, um, let's hope that the the book that we've been talking about was just one of a series, and you know we we must continue. That's the important thing. But we must we must continue. Yeah, we have already another volume. You know, it's it's yeah. an issue of of uh, interdisciplinary science reviews, I, ISR, that is already out with the the you know the papers of science in the forest, science in the past two. So it's already there. We have the second issue that might become a book or not. We we still do not know, and we are planning our third meeting if. <laughs> God helps us next year. A Paris is planning the fourth, you understand. Yes, of course. Yes, I'm always, you know, always going up. Because I think that this project we are doing together, and now we have Willard McCarthy joining us in the organization. Uh, I think that's, the, for me, that's the most interesting thing I'm into at the moment. It's the most challenging and, and, and fascinating discussions and now that I'm working with precisely science in the forest, you know, because of schooling and missionaries and et cetera, finding those, those interlocutors, scientists, and mainly Jeffrey, is just so precious. So they are just illuminating my way of thinking and, and illuminating my, my, 
my writing in a way that I cannot possibly explain. Okay. See okay. you. Lots ah, of bom, love. Só para encerrar, bem. então, né, é, agradecer imensamente a participação da Aparecida, do Geoffrey, principalmente, a Joana, né, com as perguntas. Tivemos aí né, um, um grande e belo debate. Espero que todos e todas tenham apreciado. Né, e fica aí o convite para ler o, o livro, né, que tem também a versão em livro, que está aí, a Aparecida pode mostrar aí a, o livrinho, para aqueles que queiram adquirir o livro. E também tem também uma edição especial da HAL, né, a revista de Chicago, que também tem lá uma, uma, uma parte do livro. E, então, todos estão convidados aí para saber mais sobre esse debate a partir dos outros textos e artigos e dos próprios capítulos aí do Geoffrey e da Aparecida. Vou agradecer mais uma vez né, a participação e encerramos aqui hoje para a nossa mesa de aula. Thank you. Bye. Tchau. Tchau.